We are back again with my friend Jerry Lundergan, who is the author of Hard Work, Goodwill. And you can get a free copy of this book just by visiting hardworkgoodwill.com. Um, visit us on his Facebook page at Hard Work, Goodwill. Visit him on his YouTube page at Hard Work, Goodwill. You can also visit Jerry Lundergan on iTunes and download the audiobook for free, which I have had the privilege of reading because I, I, I have a big microphone. So I just asked if I could read it for him. But Jerry, I, I would love it if you would help our audience understand a little bit about the significance of two things on here. One is the four-leaf clover and the other is the ladybug. Yes. Well, you know, we are Irish and uh, our logo ever since we've been in business in the food service business has been the four-leaf clover. The ladybug is because I happen to have a wife and five daughters, and that's our family emblem, you know, is the lo ladybug. So we all have ladybugs that we wear, you know, on our lapels when, we, when we're out in public to remind us of the love and care we have for each other and how we all work together to build our family business. Well, there you go again. Good work ethic, loyalty, and a, co a commitment to family, community, and God, and that is what Jerry stands for. But Jerry, there's something else that's kind of famous about Kentucky too. Um, uh, you, guys, you guys have any involvement in Kentucky bourbon? Well, <laughs> not yet. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know you I start- say, Only I can say to my friends across the country who are uh, interested in my book, I can, I can tell you that it's a great product. Uh -huh. and, and, and we're very proud of our Kentucky bourbon here. Yes, you are. Jerry, in the last episode, you told us about starting Lundy's Catering, a company that you began with your brothers, Mike and Tom and Lynn and Charlotte. And it just began as a family enterprise uh, uh, with, with, with opportunities that you seized because you saw an opportunity in the marketplace. You saw that your competitors weren't providing the level of customer service that you think that your community needed, and, and you started in Lexington, but I knew you grew from there. Can you tell our audience a little bit about how you succeeded in growing uh, this catering company from your first job to what it has become over the past 50 years? Sure, Michael. You know, we had no choice. We had to hustle. We had to hustle. We had to find opportunities. I mean, we had to, we just couldn't wait for the opportunities to come to us. We had to go find them and develop them. Uh, what happened, uh, in Lexington is Valvoline Oil year, years ago moved its national headquarters to Lexington, Kentucky. And, and with that, uh, my brothers and I set out to sort of meet some of the key players at Valvoline, whether we met them at a cocktail party or where we met them at a friend's house. In this case, we met one of the vice presidents, Jim Rocco, at uh, Charlie and Donna Peden's house one evening for a cocktail party, and and Charlie and uh, was in my wedding, and I was in his wedding. And who's and we, Charlie Della Pico? Charlie Peden. Charlie Peden. Who is he? He is my best friend from college, and he was in my wedding, and I was in his wedding. And he had some relationship to Valvoline. Well, no, he had a cocktail party at his house, and one of his neighbors was a fellow by the name of Jim Rocco, who he invited to his cocktail party. And Jim Rocco was the vice president of Aveline Oil. And at that cocktail party, even though I loved everybody there, the only one I really had an interest in really talking to was Jim Rocco. Because <laughs> <laughs> I knew Jim Rocco was the vice president of Aveline Oil. And he and I hit it off great. And, and he started having us do small catering jobs at some of the Aveline executives homes and then we got invited uh to do catering at the indianapolis motor speedway where valvoline was a big sponsor okay with with uh, fuel and and oil or the cars well i've never been to indianapolis michael in my life okay uh but uh they invited us to go i thought indianapolis was one day the 500 was one day it's not it's almost a whole month of activities where they do time trials and testing and then they have carburation day and then they have finally they have the race so every weekend Vaveline for three weeks would invite different groups of people to indianapolis to entertain them 
and let them see the cars. Okay. And so what we would do, we were the caterers. We were hired as the caterers. We went to Indianapolis thinking it was for one day. We were there for three weeks and they would bring people in on buses and we would, when the buses got ready to leave, we would fill them back up with beverages and food again. During the day we had big pork chop supper farm where we grilled out pork chops and steaks and we fed them all while they toured Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And then as it got closer, you know, that was about 4,000 people a weekend we were feeding. And then on the race weekend, they brought in all their big key executives and, and people that were very important to Valvoline and we fed them. And, you know, it just turned into more catering than we ever thought we would do in our lifetime. <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable. And I told my brothers, I said, guys, there's something to this. This sports catering is where it is. It's not basically local catering, catering for local people in their homes for catering jobs. It's sports catering. That's what we need to concentrate on, and that's what we need to think about. So we came home from that first race at Indianapolis and developed what we call Lundy Sports Catering. And we started sending out flyers and to everybody, uh, including – the people in Louisville, Kentucky, known as Churchill Downs, the home of the Kentucky Derby. And we went to Churchill immediately and said, look, this is what we did in Indianapolis. We can come here and build you all a, a village under tents. And you all can invite, we, you can sell those tents to customers. We can cater them and you can start a new thing in, in sports activities here. At Churchill. Well, they weren't really into it, Michael. They wanted to keep it the same way it had been for the last hundred years. No, we're not interested. No, we're not interested. Well, come to find out, they read a contract because they had just signed a contract with Chrysler. Chrysler was going to sponsor the Triple Crown, which is the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont. And in that contract, in fine print, it said that Churchill had to provide Chrysler Motors with a corporate chalet under a tent. So they called us back because we'd been there trying to promote this. And they said, can you build us one tent? So I went up there and met with them and I said, well, here's where we should build it. This little garden you've got here close to the track. But you know, this space that's here, not only can we build one, but we can build five more. And I'll tell you what, if you let me build the other five, I'll make the phone calls and I'll sell them to corporations. You can get all the money from them, from the, from the sale of the tent. We'll put the tent up for you. We'll put the tables and chairs and the umbrellas out and the little white picket fence around it. You can have all that money. All I want is the cater. I want to be the exclusive cater for your village. Let me tell you what we did. We made over 415 phone calls to sell five chalets. We sold all five of them, plus the one that Chrysler had. We sold them for 14,000, I think it was, no, it was $12,500 each, plus the food and beverage. The next year we expanded it, Churchill was so excited. We expanded it to 12 chalets. We missed, moved the chain link fence, moved it back a little bit further. Now remember, Behind these chalets was nothing but a gravel parking lot where they were parking about 200 buses at $5 each. So, you know, they were making about $1,000. The third year, we went to like 20 chalets. The fourth year, we blacktopped the entire gravel lot, and we eventually got it up to 60 chalets. They were selling them for $60,000 a chalet, and you had to buy three years at a time. <laughs> can you imagine and you did all the catering and we got all the catering <laughs> and can you imagine they had their own bedding windows back there in that village with 60 tents they had their own restrooms they had you know everything there was a private village for, for people corporate who leaders to, and so what churchill was doing was getting more people to the derby because they weren't really using any of the seats out facing the track Mm -hmm. They were getting more people. They were getting more people to make wages. 
uh, wagers, mm -hmm. and they were making money. They were getting sixty thousand dollars a chalet, and they had you had to buy it as a customer for three years because they had such a demand for these chalets. That led us into more sports catering for the PGA golf events, the Doral, the the Honda, the Colonial, the the Shell Open down in Texas. We did golf tournaments, and we would you know build the chalets also for the corporate sponsors. And we also did the general concessions for the general public who followed the golfers around on the golf courses. We did more IndyCar races and NASCAR races. And that's how we became very, very successful in the catering business sports wise. Not to mention the fact that we were building up all the time our reputation and our, our that, that we did, we're, we're great caterers and we did, catering totally in a different way than anybody else back home in Lexington for, for the local people. So that's how we built, that's how we built our catering company. So I'm a student of, of great men and, and Jerry Lundergan is a great man. He's a great American and he's a great business leader. And when you have an opportunity to listen to somebody who's taken ideas from nothing but what's in his head, a conversation with his brothers, and turn it into a business that is selling to Churchill Downs and Valvoline and the PGA and Honda and, and calling 450 corporations to sell five tenths. I hope that you can get some takeaways of what all the lessons that he just told us in hard work and goodwill. He just told us that he was willing to work for free with putting up the tents to Churchill. He didn't go there asking them, write me a check. He said, let me bring value to you. And when they didn't, they didn't act, he didn't run away bitter. He said, that's fine. But when they needed him, what did he do? That effort that he made resulted in opening an opportunity. That's the kind of wisdom you get from this book. You get from his iTunes uh, podcast, the audio book, we are trying to provide it for you in every way possible, including bringing this story into prisons across America so people can understand what it really takes to succeed. Because I know, Jerry, a lot of people will look at you and say, you're just lucky. And you said you're lucky, but they don't realize how much work and personal investment he made to hustle. This all started with hustle. Four-leaf clover, yes, there was some luck, but it was hustle of the ladybugs. That's exactly <laughs> right, six Mark. ladybugs. And you know, I know there's more than six ladybugs because I'm reading the book. You got eight little ladybugs and soon to be another ninth one coming to you. That's right. That's right. We certainly do. You know, I've been fortunate that my five daughters have blessed me with eight grandchildren. Where I had all daughters, now we have mostly boys as grandchildren. You know, we have four boys and, and two girls, but we're soon to have our ninth <laughs> grandchild who is also going to be a girl. So we're looking forward to that come this August. Well, we've got a lot to talk about. And so if Jerry has a little more time, I'm going to ask him to uh, film the next episode where we're going to talk about how one creating one business leads to new opportunities. And do you have enough time to give us a, a little bit more of the story? Sure, Michael. All right. We'll be right back with another episode from uh, my mentor, my friend, the author of Hard Work and Goodwill, Jerry Lundergan.